So, have you ever just felt singled out, like the whole group of people around you was against you? Like maybe, maybe back in high school you were that guy or that girl who always kept asking questions, uh, and everyone else was like, just shut up, the teacher's ready to let us go. Will you please be quiet? We'll get recess early. Um, or maybe somehow uh, on a sports team you became uh, an antagonistic figure in some way. People maybe blamed you for something that you had done, or, or you, were, you were in some way perceived to be a threat to, to the captain of whatever team it was. You know, I don't know in what context it might have happened, but most of us have probably had the experience of a large group of people not being happy with us. Maybe not trusting us. Uh, maybe, maybe we were in a position of leadership and we were voted down or voted against or people just refused to follow. It could happen in any number of ways. I want to tell you about a day in Jesus' life that was just like that. It was an extremely busy day. I, I know you guys think you live here at Stanford, and in many ways you are. But Jesus had one doozy of a day that I'm willing to tell you a little part of and it will probably leave you feeling exhausted. And it was a sort of day on which, in one level, everything that could have gone right went right. But on another level, everything that could have gone wrong went wrong. And I'm just going to focus on three encounters that Jesus had. And we're going to skip around a little bit. The, the text that we'll be reading from is Matthew chapter 9. And uh, Jesus is just, as we're going into this story, uh, the story right before this one is that story where he, like, he infests a herd of pigs with demons, and it makes the pig farmers very upset with them, and they say, please go away. And so he gets on a boat and leaves. We pick up right there in Matthew chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic, lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blasphemed. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven, or to say get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, Get up, take your mat, and go home. And the man got up and went home. When the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to men. A couple of thoughts. First, did you notice that at the end there? They praised God who had given such authority to men. They weren't like the Pharisees who were automatically opposed to Jesus, but even the crowd didn't get it. Maybe it's because uh, they were in Jesus' hometown. They, they, they just couldn't see there was something special about Jesus. They were just like, wow, look, people can cast out demons. That's cool. Oh, I'm sorry, wrong story. Uh, they, they can heal paralytic people. That's cool. Woohoo! They missed the point that Jesus was the healer. But then, it, even, you know, it's just weird when you go home. People have a hard time seeing growth and development and change in your life, maturation. Uh, maybe you saw that it was spring break. You went back home, and all of a sudden, you were infantilized again by your parents. Uh, you had like a curfew that was like 9 p.m. or something. You're like, hello, I usually go to bed at 3 a.m. But you don't actually tell your parents that. You're like, well, maybe you step a little bit later. How late? Midnight or so. Um, but your parents have a hard time accepting the fact that you've changed, you've grown, you've developed. You're becoming more mature, more capable, more gifted or able to navigate life. Jesus had that same problem, too. Uh, the other thing, though, that stands out to me is the, the dynamic that's happening here. Jesus has a man brought to him. And looks at the man, and he says, your sins are forgiven. And instantly, the religious experts are like, whoa, 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 whoa. That was off the heresy scale. That is bad. You can't say that. And plus, I believe on some level, there's a little bit of smirking going on on the inside. Like, you know, yeah, 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 your sins are forgiven. Boy, that's an easy, safe promise to make. We can't see any change with forgiven sins. We can't notice anything that's happened. Uh, that's like saying, I'll give you a million dollars on Tuesday. I'll believe when Tuesday comes. Jesus says, you're right there. I see what you think. It's very safe of me to say your sins are forgiven. That, that's a very innocuous promise. What would be harder? I mean, this guy's paralyzed. What if I just said, get up and walk? That would be a lot harder than saying your sins are forgiven, isn't it? And you know that I won't do it. Surprise, I'm Jesus. Rise up and walk. And by the way, his sins really are forgiven. The story moves on. We're going to skip over the next little bit in which 
uh, he calls the disciple we come to call Matthew. At the time called Levi. We skip forward to, to verse 18. A ruler came and knelt before Jesus and said, My daughter is just dying. But come and put your hand on her, and she will live. Jesus got up and went with, her, with him, and so did his disciples. Just then, a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I'll be healed. Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment. When Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd, he said, Go away. The girl is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After the crowd had been put outside, he went and took the girl by the hand and she got up. News of this spread throughout all that region. First, a detail in this story that's very jarring to me. It's a funeral, and they laugh at him. That's weird. Does anyone else find that slightly incongruous? You have to understand the cultural context for that to make a little bit of sense. In this culture at that time, it was considered uh, appropriate and, and a way to honor the deceased to, to, to hire professional mourners to come and to sort of put on a commotion and to do about the fact that the person was dead. Uh, and there would be musicians, and then there would be the, the wailers. The people would just be like, Whoa! She was the best person ever! And they'd never met her before in their life. Um, it's sort of like the way that today, in our culture, we will hire musicians to perform at our wedding. Um, except in addition to musicians, they would also bring in these the sort of actors. And it was very common, very culturally accepted. But think about these people's jobs for a minute. These are like professional celebrators of death. If you know anybody whose job involves death, like say a police officer, or, um, or maybe an ER nurse, or uh, uh, some sort of a paramedic, you will notice that they very frequently develop what is called a morbid or gallows sense of humor. You just can't be around death that much without having uh, laughter as a fence in it. And so Jesus comes in, and these guys, they're professional death experts. They only get called in when the body is dead. They know death. They walk in, they're like, okay, the girl is dead. Ah, she was the best girl ever! And Jesus comes in and says, whoa, 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 she's not dead, she's asleep. It's just too much like, you are Ridiculous. You are a certifiable lunatic. You are an object, sir, worthy of derision and scorn. I laugh at you. Ha, ha, ha. Um, and Jesus clears the room. And then he reaches out and touches the girl. And she comes to life. One more story we're going to look at. And then we're going to look at the theme that connects them all. The thread that runs through each. We skip ahead to verse 32. Now we're skipping over another story where Jesus healed two blind men. This is all on the same day. So he starts off, heals a paralytic guy. Well, first off, he, he like gets on a boat and leaves you know, one place where he casts some demons and pigs. Then he heals a paralytic guy, calls a disciple. Uh, what was the last one he did? Oh, yeah. He, uh, he heals a woman with a flow of blood, raises a girl from the dead. Then he goes, he heals two blind guys. And then, in verse 32, while they were going out from healing these blind guys, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, It is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. What do all these stories have in common? Simply this. In each story, there is one person or a small group of people who has faith, who believes in Jesus, who trusts Jesus, and they're in the midst of a crowd that is considerably more skeptical. Now, in each case, the reason for their skepticism differs. The manifestation of their skepticism differs. But the dynamics are the same in each story. Look, we'll go through them one at a time. So in the first story, we have the paralytic man. The paralytic man is brought there by his friends. They had faith. But the Pharisees, they look and they say, Jesus is immoral. He's wicked. He's evil. He's a blasphemer. He is a wrongdoer. He is not to be trusted in the area of, of, of knowledge of what life's all about because he's failed the most basic test of integrity. Now, people still think that today about Jesus. There are many people today who still have a healthy degree of skepticism about Jesus as a moral person. I, I'm shocked sometimes when I hear some of the claims that people make about Jesus. Um, 
You know, there are people who are outraged that Jesus was not uh, aggressive enough in condemning uh, the evils of the society of his day, the evils that they want him to have condemned. There are people who say Jesus wasn't a vegetarian, therefore, you know, I'm more moral than him because I don't take the life of, 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 of animals to eat them. There are people who, who will find all sorts of reasons to judge Jesus. He's intolerant. He's axed on the blame. And many of them are here too. People who won't look at Jesus just because, at root, they have the same attitude as the Pharisees. Now, there's another category of people that we encounter in these stories today. We move ahead and we see that when Jesus went to raise that young girl from the dead, the response he received was laughter. They thought Jesus was ridiculous. Who had faith? The girl's father. And the woman who reached out and touched the hem of his robe. These two had faith. The crowd? None. Uh, not even were they neutral. They were openly mocking Jesus. Yesterday, I was in a meeting. I was sharing my faith uh, with some students and professors here at Stanford. Uh, and on my left was, was a guy who was just joining this conversation that had been ongoing for a while. Uh, he's an atheist. And he's a grad student. And uh, hey, he didn't know I was a minister, which is usually the case. And it's always a lot of fun to sort of spring that on people partway through a sentence. Um, but uh, he just started spouting off about... In fact, this is almost a red book. This is as close as I can get it. You know, the only mistake that David Koresh made was being born in the 21st century. I mean, if he had been born 2,000 years ago, eh, we worship his God today, and he probably wouldn't even, would have even sent out 12 disciples. Now, what's he doing? Well, clearly he's saying that Jesus was a fraud, just like David Koresh. If you don't remember who that was, he's, uh, as in this guy's memorable phrase, the wacko from Waco. Uh, the cult leader who, who led a bunch of them to their death uh, a few years ago in Texas. And he's saying Jesus was as credible as this, this laughable guy, this guy who made completely implausible, outrageous claims. Jesus is ridiculous. And there are people on this campus who think that not only is Jesus ridiculous, but the fact that you trust him is ridiculous. That you would place your faith and something that is so obviously flawed and passe and has been disproven by, by the assured results of modern scholarship. And have you read the Da Vinci Code? <laughs> they think Christianity and Jesus are jokes. The man's father, or the woman's father, the girl's father had faith, and the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' robe had faith. The crown, no faith. And then finally, we meet a, a, a demon possessed man. And Jesus performs an exorcism. Jesus casts the demon out of the guy. And to this, the Pharisees, the religious experts, the, the, the experts of the day don't know what to say. And so they simply say, there must be another explanation. There's something else at work here. It's not God. At most, it's Satan. It's some other supernatural force. It's certainly not the God of the Bible. It's not that God. It's not Jesus. <coughs> and I'm amazed that these same dynamics, the three uh, launching paths for skepticism, still come up in society today. In fact, as you might see in the news in the last two or three days, and even busy relocating here, uh, getting over here, but th there's a study that just came out, literally it was announced yesterday. Uh, there's a guy, he's a professor of oceanography at Florida State University, and he just made this announcement. And it's going to be published in the Journal of Paleolimnology, uh, of which existence I was given to unaware. Uh, but basically, uh, he's an ocean oceanographer, and he's discovered that, according to certain climatic models, it seems possible that there were uh, little flows of ice floating about the Sea of Galilee 2,000 years ago. There's like a one in a couple hundred chance that on any given day there might be a flow of ice out there in the Sea of Galilee. And so he says, wow, the only time this works for is a couple of decades around Jesus' life. So when the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water... He must have been floating on ice. He was ice surfing. And, hey, it just struck me. The parallel with, with this, there must be another explanation. There's got to be another explanation. No matter how implausible, like, like this, this explanation is, the way you drive out demons is, demons are doing it. Your explanation? Not so helpful. Unless demons are really, really stupid. In which case, how come they keep outsmarting you? Um... Uh, in this case, it reminds me of an old joke. There was a Sunday school teacher. Um, you know, she had been at one time a very deep believer in the Bible. She went off to uh, to college, had some very co some courses that very deeply affected her faith. And 
took some courses on the history of the Bible, and one of the things that her professors taught her was that when the Israelites crossed the Red Sea, that was a typo. They actually crossed the Reed Sea. Uh, and the Reed Sea is a very shallow body of water, and, and the, the Israelites just walked over it. So she's teaching her Sunday school class this, and the little kids are in there to listen. Uh, and this one kid goes, Johnny, that's amazing! No, 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 Johnny, you don't understand. The point is, it's not amazing. It was just like walking through a big mud puddle. They just walked on through there, and, and I mean, they barely even got the tops of their ankles wet. And Johnny goes, that's even more amazing! No, Johnny, you don't understand. There's nothing amazing about this story at all. There was no party in the water. There was no stick. There was no staff. There was no miracle that happened. What's amazing about it? And he said, that the entire Egyptian army drowned in that much water. <laughs> um, in other words, whenever you create a solution like this, you create other problems. Like, the story of Jesus walking on water is in the context of this massive storm that is scaring seasoned fishermen to death. People who spend their entire lives on the ocean, on the water, the open water, are saying, we're going to die in this storm. And there's Jesus, ice surfing. <laughs> what? How is that even an explanation? Uh, but people have this deep, deep need to explain away Jesus, to explain away God. Maybe you heard about a study that came out in the last few days. The power of prayer. Anybody see this lady? Uh, it's amazing. Like, and, and just for context, this is a battle that wages and rages back and forth and back and forth. Scholars keep studying whether or not prayer for healing has any effect. And they set up these carefully controlled double-blind experiments, and they do the best that they can. Um, but bottom line, uh, you, you will go from one study to the next, and literally they will just contradict one another flat out. Yes, we see a significant difference made by prayer. Next study, and the one that most recently came out, so the one that's got press. We see no statistical difference as a result of prayer, except perhaps for a slight negative uh, effect on your survivability, like 1% chance, statistically negligible. And this is the kind of thing that really rots a lot of people's faith. It really bothers a lot of people. Here's the problem with studies like that. Um, uh, first, uh, there is no such thing as uninterpreted data. You probably have all heard a statement like that at some point in your lives. It is no more true uh, anywhere else than it is true here. Uh, I was reading a website called Scrabbleface the other day, um, which is a comedy site. I wonder if I put my note in here for this. Yes, Scrabbleface. Uh, most most websites, most serious websites. This is like the Daily Show of news uh, on the web. Uh, most serious web, you know websites or, or news or you said uh, study just in prayer doesn't work. This is Scrabbleface's interpretation. Prayer study: humans fail to manipulate God. A team of scientists today ended a 10-year study on the so-called power of prayer by concluding that God cannot be manipulated by humans, not even by scientists with a $2.4 million research grant. The scientists also noted that their work was sabotaged by religious zealots who could not be prevented by praying for the study subjects who, according to their experimental research, were supposed to receive no prayer. And that's the problem with all studies like this. You don't know who's actually getting prayed for. All you know is you've recruited a team of anonymous strangers to pray for this you know, person X is recovered. You don't know if person A's mom has been a Christian for 50 years and is de desperately praying for person A's healing. You don't know if there's an entire prayer chain going on. It's, it's literally impossible to set up an control, controlled environment for these studies unless you just take, um, you kidnap people and keep them locked away for 10 years until their relatives give up hope that they're alive so they stop praying. And then you experiment on them and have people praying for them and other people not praying for them. And it's the only way you can do it. Um, people just have this deep-set need to figure God out and to explain God away. And anything that could be attributed to supernatural, to just write on out of the playbook. And I don't know if you've noticed that, but even some of your professors have that tendency. Some of the people in your dorm have that tendency. But this is what stands out to me from these stories. In each case, someone had faith. Sometimes a small group, sometimes a single person. But they stood in defiance of the crowd, of the prevailing mood of their immediate cultural context, of the, the campus on which they found themselves, of the classroom in which they found themselves, of the dormitory in which they found themselves. And they expressed their trust in Jesus in the same way each time. They asked for his help. They made a request. They said, Jesus, I have a need. 
will you please meet my need for me or for my friend? And I'm amazed that in this one day, the level of authority that Jesus demonstrated over life's problems. What's the very first thing that happens? The paralyzed man comes in, is brought up, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Jesus has the power to bring forgiveness. What's the next thing that happens? Rise and walk. Jesus has the power to bring help. The next story they looked at, a little girl was dead. And Jesus said, girl, get up. Jesus has the power to bring life. And then he comes to a demonized man. A man who's afflicted by evil spirits. And says, be gone. Jesus has the power to bring freedom. He has power over forgiveness, health, life, and freedom. Each of these people had to stand in isolation from the broader culture. Had to risk the ridicule that fell upon Jesus falling upon themselves. The skepticism that fell upon Jesus falling upon themselves. But they were bold in asking because no one else could help them. Tonight, this quarter here at Stanford, what do you need from Jesus? You are in no different situation than these people 2,000 years ago. One of the key promises of the Bible is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. If you had power over forgiveness then, he's got power to grant forgiveness now. If you had power to bring health then, he's got power to bring health now. If you had power to bring freedom then, he's got power to bring freedom now. And maybe you need new life. Obviously, none of you are physically dead right now. But maybe you're dead on the inside. Jesus can bring you new life tonight. If you do the same thing they did, express your trust. Make the request. One of the